as Jill said, I'm so grateful for Jill. Um, she's been a friend for a very long time for her and Mike and Pastor Jonathan. Um, give it up for them, you guys. Can you guys? Yes. They are um, the heart and soul of what help all these chapels go on that you guys have seen all weekend and also today. But if you're new to SEU, I want you to know that these chapels are put on by students for students. And that's what's really cool. So the production side is we have a bunch of student volunteers up in the back booth, which is incredible. I know. And all our worship leaders are students just like you. So it's just a really cool place to be at a place where we believe in education, but we believe in like practical opportunities for students to do what they're learning to do so that they can go out and make the world a better place when they graduate. So as she said, I'm the vice president for student development. I've been at SEU for 15 years. Yay! <laughs> I know, I never want to leave. I hope they don't ever kick me out um, until I'm 65 when I can retire promptly the day I turn 65. <laughs> um, but anyways, I've been the vice president for six years. And uh, okay, okay, great. This is going to be a great crowd. Um, but I want to just introduce myself a little bit to the people in the room that don't know me. I have been a sugar mama to my husband for 10 years. <laughs> yes, he's on the front row. His name is Louie. And um, if you ever, I don't do Instagram much, but I have this hashtag that says everybody needs a Louie because I waited a really long time for my Louie. Um, I met him on a blind date. I'm five years older, so some may say cougar. I say I'm a puma um, because it's not quite, you know, as bad as cougars. I'm a little bit of a puma, but um, he is proof that it, it's worth the wait. He is proof that it's worth like waiting on the Lord to tell you exactly who to be with. He is proof that um, his plans are better than my plans. I had had many, many heartbreaks that I thought, there's no way I'm not going to marry this guy. And I always got someone a lot better. So I'm so grateful for him. Louis and I are parents to two beautiful blonde yellow labs. And they are the heart and soul of our house. And um, I was going to have a picture, but I get nervous that pictures won't come on the screen and you ask for them. Anyone else feel that anxiety when a speaker's like, I think the picture, no, okay, no, okay. Anyways, just imagine there's like two labs. There's a 10-year-old one and a 6-year-old one. They're, they're my favorite. I like dogs more than humans. Anyone else? Yes. If you like cats, it's okay. Um, we don't have to talk about it because I don't love cats. But I want to get to know you guys. How many freshmen do I have in the room? Yeah, okay. What about sophomores? Juniors? All right. What about my seniors? What? Yay! You came back to see me. That's why. I get it. Thank you. I promise freshmen we won't forever be like, where are all our freshmen in the room? Because I feel like everyone's been doing it all week. We're not always going to like point at you so we can figure out who you are. I promise. But this week, you've heard a lot about the word home. On all our signs down the way, it says, welcome home. There are people holding up signs that said, welcome, when you came in. There are people that say, this is your home away from home. There are people that say, this is your new home. Or on Monday, we heard, this is the house. Good. I was worried that you guys weren't going to get that. For some, home is a destination, and if you're talking about a destination for me personally, I was born and raised in Lakeland, Florida. Are there any other people out there? Yes? Five of us. Yes! Okay, my people. There's not a lot of people born and raised in Lakeland and choose to stay here, but I love this place. So I've met a lot of people this weekend. Who here is from Michigan? Okay, not as many as I thought. I don't want to leave out the states like Wyoming. Okay, yes, I met your parents this weekend. Um, I always feel bad for the states like the Wyoming, the North Dakotas, the South Dakotas. I don't think anyone ever gets shout outs for those states. So if you are like out west, can you give me a little like, woo? Okay, okay. Hey, I met you. Um, what about people from Georgia? Okay, okay. I love Georgia too. Um, anyways, for me, the word home has both a spiritual and a physical meaning. Physically, my home is wherever Louis is. I know, sweet. <laughs> Let's take a moment. I mean it, though. I feel like if I'm not with him, then my compass is wrong. It's off. Um, he is home to me. He is my, I'm like this, 
and he's like, mm. And so when I'm with him, I just feel so at home. Physically, that's where my home is. Spiritually, my home is wherever the Lord is, wherever he dwells. And he dwells right here in my heart. And today, we're going to talk about the heart. But before we get into that, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. I thank you for Southeastern University and the multitude of lives that are impacted here, God, through hearing your word, Lord. And I pray that everyone in this room, Lord, just takes a moment, rids themselves of distractions, and makes room in their heart for you to come in and do what you do best. In your name I pray, amen. So when I was five years old, actually, let's go back to when I was born. I... (laughs) You guys are like, we don't have all day. (laughs) I promise I won't take that long. But I was born in the church, practically. I was born at Lakeland Regional Medical Facility. And on the day I came home, it was Easter Sunday. So I literally was taken from the hospital to the church in an Easter egg. I know. I should have brought a picture of that. The Easter egg was literally like, I think, Humpty Dumpty round. My arms were out the side and my legs were out the bottom, (laughs) and they carried me like this into the church. So what I mean I am churched, I'm like church, church. I've been there literally since I was three days old. And as I was growing up, I always heard people about saying, you have to give your heart to the Lord, or you have to ask the Lord to come into your heart to be the ruler of your life, and that is your salvation story. So when I was five years old, I decided to give my life to Jesus. I remember I was a Sparky and a Wana. Anyone? Okay, okay, I want a people, great. I was a little sparky. It's what the little five-year-olds do. You wore this cute little vest. And I remember going into this room and praying and asking the Lord to come into my heart to be the ruler of my life. And my life has never been the same. And I don't have this huge testimony of I was saved from all these things at the age of five. I was probably saved from like, like stealing someone's crayon or something like that. But I do know from the age of five to now being 40, If I would have just left my faith at the five-year-old state, I wouldn't be where I am today spiritually. So you always have to go through this consecrating process, this process of evaluating or examining your heart. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about three different ways that you can prepare your heart to be at home. Scripture says, Psalm 51, 10 through 12, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your willing spirit. So the first thing you need to do to prepare your heart to be a home is to examine it. Um, I also like to say to make room in your heart. Psalm 139, 23, and 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. So when I think about examining my heart, I'm a very practical person. So when I found out that the Lord was living in my heart, I just imagined this tiny little miniature Lego-sized God that was just coming right inside my heart to just take up space there. Anyone else envisioned that? Okay, great. I'm not as crazy as I thought. Um, But I kind of loved it because it just meant that, like, the Lord was here. He wasn't going anywhere. And anything I face, he was going to be in my heart to help me. And the heart is the vessel that pumps the blood to every single thing that we go through. Your brain sends triggers to the heart. There's all these things that you can learn in sciences that I won't get into. But when I examine my heart, I try to think of all the things in my heart that I just need to be aware of and start making room for getting rid of so that the Lord can come and do what he does best. And I think about this best when I think about cleaning out my refrigerator. It's nasty. (laughs) So um, a lot of times my husband will be like, oh, babe, the fridge kind of smells. And so we'll go through the fridge. I try to do this every Friday because I'm a control freak. And so on Friday mornings, actually, I go through my entire fridge. I check all the expiration dates. And anything that's been in a Tupperware for longer than it should be, I get rid of it. Because trash goes out on Friday, and I don't want it to smell up the trash can for the whole week. So that's why I do it on Fridays. So when I think about examining my heart, I'm examining the things that are old, dirty, that have been there. Maybe I've shoved them away for a while, and I haven't wanted to deal with them. Kind of like cleaning your room when your parents are like, hey, you need to clean your room. Grandma's coming. And you shove everything in your closet. Do I have people that do that? That's fine. But when you shove things in your closet, you're not actually taking care of them. You're just 
putting them away for a later date for it to fester and create anxiety. And it's time to take it out and do something with it. So when I talk about examining your heart, we're doing this constant process of examining things in our life. Maybe it's anxious thoughts. Maybe it's a past relationship that ended poorly. Maybe it's you're angry at a parent or maybe you're angry at a friend and it's just been built up and built up and you're not allowing the Lord to do anything because you need to get rid of it. And I think about another thing that I hold on to are clothes. I have a closet full of clothes that, yes, I see you, full of things that are like out of date, like most people that work for me tell me like some of my stuff's like pretty old. Um, Not old and like I've had it too long, old and like style. So it's like seasonal things. I also have a stack of jeans or pants in a closet in a different room that I call my skinny pants. Anyone else have those? Okay, yes. And they've been my skinny pants for 15 years. <laughs> like, I wore them at 25, and I looked really good in them at 25, and I keep thinking, one day. One day I'm getting back into those pants. Um, but I'm not. Let's be real. Those pants, when I was 25, served for a great purpose. But at 40, I need to get rid of them because it's not my reality. You may have some core memories that are great memories, And you still hold on to them of like, I wish I could get back back there. Um, If this would have kept happening, shoulda, coulda, woulda, and you keep living into the what used to be instead of living into the presence of what the Lord has for you here and now. So some of you need to clean out your closet and make room for the new things that the Lord has. And I'm not saying the past is bad. The past is great, but it's time to let it go because that was it. And now let's live in today, Thursday, the first week of school, and say, Lord, what do you have for me? I'm making room for you. I'm examining my heart. But please, what do you have for me in this season? And I have a story about a student named Kendall. Some of you in this room who've worked for a while know Kendall. She's from Alabama. Anyone? And I say it like that because she literally was from Alabama. And um, she had big hair. And she was an incredible freshman. I had the opportunity to mentor her when she came in. And I remember when she came in, she's been dating this guy for like five years. Nothing wrong with that at all. He's a great guy. Um, they had had their engagement pictures done. They had their engagement rings picked out for in four years when he was going to propose. She knew the date they were going to get married. She knew the name of their three kids they were going to have. She knew she was going to major in this degree and graduate and go back home to Alabama. And they're going to get married to be a stay-at-home mom, which all these things are great dreams and aspirations. But she was clouded by a heart that had zero room for the Lord to come in and do what he saw fit. Kendall was living in what she saw fit for her life, and she had a moment her sophomore year where her resident director, any RDs in the room? They're like, no? Okay. I love you guys. They're checking everyone in. So resident directors are the people that oversee your resident halls, and her RD saw Kendall and said, I feel like I need to tell you that you're not you're clouded by something. I don't know what that means, but I just feel like you really need to dive into what the Lord has for you. And that unlocked something in Kendall for her to realize that she has been so easily entangled with her own desires and her own thoughts of what she wanted her life to be like, that she needed to just surrender and give her life to the Lord. And she ended up breaking up with her boyfriend. So I I don't want everyone leaving here and breaking up with their boyfriend. That's not the point. You need to ask the Lord, what do you have for my life in this season? And so she ended up Uh, breaking up with him. I'm going to try to make this story shorter. She graduated from Southeastern. She came back and got her master's here. She ended up working for me and became the first year experience coordinator. And now she mentors hundreds of girls across the country who've given their lives to the Lord. And her life looks drastically different than what she thought it was going to look like, but it's everything that she needed it for her life. And now her story has made a difference in other people's stories. So you don't know what examining your heart and making room for the Lord to do what he needs to do or wants to do, how it's going to impact other people. She's impacted me so greatly. Now, Ephesians 3, 19 through 21 says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, this is my favorite part. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, That word immeasurably more, that means it's more than we could ever think, ask, or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forevermore. 
My other favorite verse is Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who called, who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I remember going into college thinking, everyone always said, oh, you're going to have a line of people ready to date you. And I got to college and was like, No, for real. I was like, hello, anyone? <laughs> There's no line. Uh, and <laughs> literally, <laughs> so I get to 20, I'm 21, I'm a senior still, no line. Um, and I thought in my dreams that I was going to, and I told the Lord, I'm going to be married at 22. I'm going to start having kids at 25. I'll have my three kids by 30. And then at 30, my husband will work and make a ton of money, and I'll just stay home at my pool all day, and I'll be a soccer mom. I got married at 29. I don't have kids. It is the most beautifully fulfilled life I've ever had in my life because I decided I was going to give my life to the Lord, put it in his hands because my plans were not working, but he orders my steps, and his steps are better than my steps, and now I never imagined my life could feel so fulfilled. So if you're in this room, make some room because he's ready to fill it, which leads me to my next point. Fill it. Fill your heart. But we have to be careful what we fill our heart with. You know when you fill a cup of coffee? I don't drink coffee. I'm like a Coke Zero girl, so let's just pretend I have a styrofoam cup with crushed ice and a Coke Zero, okay? If it's filled to the brim, doesn't that sound good? Some of you are like, yes, please. I have it filled to the brim. If I run into someone, what's going to spill on them? Coke, right. So what you fill yourself up with is what you're going to spill onto other people. So we have to be careful what we fill our hearts with. My least favorite scripture um, in the Bible is Luke 6, 45. And you're allowed to have least favorites. Like, the Lord and I don't play. He knows everything. He knows my thoughts. It says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. This is the part that gets me. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, I don't know about y'all, but my mouth gets me in trouble. I think when the Lord, like, I imagine, like, when the Lord created me, there's this assembly line, and he's, like, putting in my heart and my ribs and my spleen and all the things, and then it gets to the filter part. I didn't get it. Like, literally, the Lord just was like, no, she doesn't have a filter. I think they just, like, they messed it up a little bit. Obviously, I'm kidding. If you're new to faith, that's not how it works, but I do not have a filter. Things, like, come out of my mouth before it can catch up to my brain. Anyone else like that? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, sorry, I have to repent. But I know in those moments, it's usually because I haven't been filling my heart with the goodness of God. And um, I heard this quote by, I think it's Earl McClelland, and he said, a critical mouth is usually connected to a contaminated heart. So I've known that I need to completely, every day, fill my life with scripture, fill my life with worship music, fill my life with friends that surround me that can call me out on things so that I don't turn to have a critical mouth, which turns into a critical heart. My husband and I, we built a house uh, this past year. It took forever. And we finally got into it in December, and we had to start putting furniture in our house. Now, old me would just get hand-me-downs, anything from Ikea I could find, because it's a little bit inexpensive, and that's okay. That was the season I was in, but now I hope this house is my forever home. So we're trying to buy things that are made out of real wood, good structure that will last a lifetime. So those are the types of things that you need to be filling your heart with, not cheap stuff, not hand-me-downs from old other things. You need to be filling your heart with the real stuff, the good stuff, the stuff that's going to last a lifetime. From the biblical sense, we need to allow the Lord to fill us up, be rich in knowledge, be rich in love, and be rich in wisdom. Now, lastly, we have to guard our hearts. Now, what does this mean? Everyone always says, guard your heart. And I'm like, cool. What do I do? Like, <laughs> do I have a sword? Do I have a shield? What does this mean? Like, what does that mean? Like, when you're dating someone, guard your heart. Okay. Um... Like, don't tell them about myself. Like, should I not be open? Am I too open? Like, should I hold their hand, not hold their hand? Like, what does the guard your heart look like? Um, I've heard this phrase my whole life. What's really cool, the Lord, when designing us, actually guarded our hearts by our rib cage. 
Anyone knew that? I kind of just learned that. I'm sorry, I know. Um, Our ribs are this cage that surrounds our heart and protects all our vital organs. So he's already gone before us and protected it physically. And now we need to go and protect it spiritually and mentally. Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. Can you guys handle seven verses with me? Okay. I love the Proverbs. I've been reading it this whole summer. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Now here's the verse. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight forward. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Now, when I think of guarding your heart, I think about all the arrows that come our way. Arrows of people's criticisms about you. Arrows of people not liking you. Arrows of people's opinions. And now there's some good arrows, like Cupid had some good arrows. Um, There's arrows that my husband could shoot at me that might be a little hard to hear, but sometimes hard to hear things are okay. And those arrows should be allowed to penetrate your heart. Now, there's some arrows from people that should be treated more like Nerf guns. So if I'm okay with my husband shooting an arrow at me out of love, of course. Now, let's see, you six rows back in the New York shirt. If you shot an arrow at me, it wouldn't affect me. And I don't mean it's not because I don't love you as a person. I just don't know you and you don't know me. And you should treat arrows like that and other people around you the same. A lot of you get so tripped up by the opinions of other people. And you're allowing those arrows to get through to your heart and it just wrecks you when they weren't meant for you to begin with. So you have to figure out whose voices in your life need to have the arrow and whose need to have the Nerf gun, the ones that just hit you and bounce right off you. It doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect your calling. And that's been really hard for me to do. I've had a really long time to work on that. And it doesn't mean that some criticisms aren't going to be painful. That's what growth looks like. It doesn't mean that all arrows are bad. Some of them are great. You get... Um, a lot of people that say, you did such a great job, and you're doing amazing. It's just the ones that are the people that really don't know you or have no business talking about you. I want to give you guys some tips about how I've guarded my heart over the past 40 years. One of my biggest phrases I learned from a previous boss, he always said to me, Bethany, do right and fear nothing. And I'm a people pleaser, so I need everyone to love me all the time. And if you don't love me, I'm going to like be your best friend until you love me. And then if you still don't love me, I'm going to keep trying. But what I mean by that is there are times I make tough decisions. There are times I might have to let someone go. There are times I might not be present for someone in the way they wanted me to. But as long as I'm right with my heavenly father, as long as my, uh, my motives were right, I don't need to fear anything else because he's the one I care about the most. The next one is someone's opinion about you is none of your business. That one's really hard for me because I care about everyone's opinions. But God is the only opinion that I need to actually worry about. As long as I'm pleasing to my heavenly father, I'm not worried about pleasing man. Because I'm not judged by man, I'm judged by my heavenly father. The next one is surround yourself with a group of people to hold you accountable and build you up. I've been in a place where I've surrounded myself with a group of people that didn't hold me accountable and didn't build me up, and I felt empty. But when I was about 25, I made an evaluation of all my friends, and I was like, which friends in my life are actually pouring into me and not sucking the life out of me? And that's what I've decided to guard my heart with are the friends that will call me out. I have friends that will literally be like, hey, this sounds like you're gossiping. And I'm like, no, I'm not gossiping. I'm just talking about someone else. It's fine. But, but those are the friends that you want because it just stops you in your track and it's like, you're right. I'm not saying something good and let's move on from that. And I don't have to be butthurt about it. I can say thank you and we can move on. And my final one is don't take advice from someone that you don't want to be like. A lot of us are asking people's opinions all the time and we are trying to please this person and please this person. But if you don't want to be like them, then you have no business asking advice from them. What works for them may not work for you. 
Now, as we close, if I could get everyone to stand to their feet. I promise you won't have to stand for long. I was thinking about where are you guys in this cleansing cycle of your heart? Some of you may be just in the examining stage. You're starting to wonder, okay, what are those things that are like preventing me from making room for the Lord? Is it my anxiety that just cripples me so badly? Is it from past relationships I haven't been able to get over? Is it the opinions of others? Where are you in that? I want you to know that we have professors here. We have staff members. We have mentors that you guys can go seek out to talk through some of those things. I have a coach. I've always had a coach that could I go to about anything and everything that can help pray with me about these things and help me figure out, are these an arrow I need to take or is it a Nerf gun that needs to bounce off me? So where are you in that examining process? Maybe you're in the process where you're like, Bethany, I have examined, I've made room, but I'm trying to figure out how to fill it. And I don't even know where to begin. I'm going to tell you, just start reading the Bible. Start filling your heart with scriptures. If you don't know where to start, start in Psalms. I love the Psalms. Uh, they just bring joy into your heart. So start reading the Psalms. We just saw we have uh, reading plans. You can go on the Bible app, join the reading plan, and do a reading plan. It's super short and simple, but just start small. Don't feel like you have to accomplish the whole Bible in a week. Or you could join a group. I know we talk about that a lot. I love small groups. It's a time we all can come together and know more about each other and know more about faith. But those are all practical ways you can fill it. And lastly, maybe you're at the part where you need to guard it. Ask the Lord to help filter those arrows that come your way. Ask your community to also help build you up instead of tear you down. Now, the last thing I want to do is... I can't help but think that there's probably people in this room that when I talked about asking the Lord into your heart, you thought, I haven't even done that yet. I haven't even started with the surrendering my life and asking him to be the ruler and the king of my heart. I know we go to a Christian private school and everyone that goes here is supposed to be a Christian, but I'm not naive to know that some people have their parents check the box at their application. Um, or maybe you're in here thinking, I came here for a great scholarship, um, but I do want to know more about this Jesus thing. It's not too late to give your heart to the Lord. And so with all eyes closed, Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want to give a moment where people can actually pray this prayer of salvation. So if you're in this room and you're like, I've never asked the Lord to take over my life. I've never asked the Lord to be the ruler of my life, or I've never been saved before. I would love for you guys to have the opportunity now. So with no eyes looking, if you're in this room and you're like, you know what, today's the day I want to give my life to the Lord. I'm going to count to three and I want you to raise your hand. No one's looking. It's just between you and God. One, two, three. Amen. I see your hand. This is a beautiful thing. This is the best decision you'll ever make in your whole life. So with all of us, let's say this together as a community. Please repeat after me. Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that he gave his life to forgive my sins and was raised from the grave to give me life. I receive your grace by faith. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen and amen. Yes. SEU, I love you. If you decided that today was the day you wanted to give your heart to the Lord, we have a connections tent right outside. Please go out there, connect with someone, and they would love to go on this journey with you. Have a great day, everybody.